Disclaimer. The blue eye brown eye experiment is actually referred to as an exercise, not an experiment. Content note. This video contains mentions of race and racism, specifically anti-black racism, during the latter half of the 20th century. You think you know how that would feel yeah. to be judged by the color of your skin? Yeah. I don't, do you think you do? Mm. No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? A few months ago, I decided to make a video about the third wave, a 1967 experiment in which high school teacher Ron Jones started the third wave, a fake fascist movement in order to show his students how easy it is to be swept up in fascist ideology. In that video, I mentioned that when I was in third grade in 2002 to 2003, my teacher did a one-day experiment, or should I say exercise, exercise, sorry, in which the blue-eyed and brown-eyed students were split up. I don't remember much about the exercise except that I was put in the front of the class and the blue-eyed students sat in the back. I got some comments saying that what happened in my third grade class in the early 2000s was actually based on a real-life exercise that originated in 1968 by educator Jane Elliott, in which she separated her class by eye color, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Jane Elliott's exercise in trying to create racial empathy and understanding, if it works, and my own personal thoughts on it after doing my research. I also want to touch on Jane Elliott's career as one of the most well-known diversity educators of the 80s and 90s, and whose teachings were at the forefront when the U.S. workplace started to become, well, diversified. Not to mention how her exercise eventually garnered the attention of Stanford professor Philip G. Zimbardo, who eventually created the Stanford Prison Experiment. It's a small world, isn't it? And lastly, I want to talk about how the exercise in Elliott's teachings and influence in schools and the workplace have shaped how we think about racism today. So with all that said, let's get started. Part 1. The 1968 Classroom Exercise On April 4th, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement, was assassinated. The next day, on April 5th, 1968, elementary school teacher Jane Elliott decided to finally go through with her blue eye brown eye exercise. Elliott was, I guess you could say, inspired by the death of Martin Luther King Jr. to finally really teach her kids about racism. As she says in the 1985 documentary, A Class Divided, she had this idea in her head for a while, but never used it, but now it was time. In the documentary, she says that what really got to her was the condescending nature of the white male news anchors who were interviewing black community leaders after they got news of MLK's death. She said they were arrogant and belittling, and that really set her off. Elliot says in the film that she was teaching her all-white third-grade class about racism since the school year began, but she really wanted them to feel what it was like to be on the receiving end of it. In other stories, she says that a student came up to her the day after MLK's assassination and asked, why'd they shoot that king? But in reality, it was premeditated and planned the night before, and honestly, she seemed to have this idea in her head for at least a few months. So on the first day, the brown-eyed kids were privileged and the blue-eyed and lighter-eyed kids were discriminated against. They were made to wear armbands to be easily identified. They weren't allowed seconds at lunch, and they had to drink water from the water fountain with a cup rather than directly from it. At recess, the brown-eyed kids got an extra five minutes of recess, whereas the blue-eyed kids didn't, and they weren't allowed to play together. The blue-eyed kids also weren't given homework because, as she put it, they'd probably forget to bring the assignment back to class. In an NPR interview done in 2020, Elliot remembers during her lunch break in the teacher's lounge how one of the teachers openly said she was glad MLK was killed and how no one spoke up against that teacher. She said they all either smiled or laughed and nodded. The interaction only strengthened Elliot's resolve. She decided to continue the exercise with her students after lunch. The next day, the roles were reversed. The blue-eyed kids were on top and the brown-eyed kids were on the bottom. Surprisingly or unsurprisingly, the blue-eyed kids weren't as vicious as the brown-eyed kids were on that first day. Later, it would occur to Elliot that the blueies were much less nasty than the brown-eyed kids had been, perhaps because the blue-eyed kids had felt the sting of being ostracized and didn't want to inflict it on their former tormentors. Later that year, Elliot was invited on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson to talk about her exercise, and it blew up her 800-person hometown of Riceville, Iowa. Concerned parents called in asking why she would do that to children, but in reality, most of their disgust was that she put white children through that. She was universally hated in her small town, and the academic community didn't really know what to make of it. It, except to say that the exercise should have been done with older students. Elliot would conduct the exercise for nine more years with third graders, and the next eight years with seventh and eighth graders before giving up teaching in Riceville in 1985. Though she did the exercise for many years, the documentary highlights the 1970 third grade class doing the exercise rather than the initial 1968 class, and it also had them come back together as adults and reflect on what they learned 15 years ago, and that's what I want to talk about now. Part 2 the 1970 classroom exercise. 
In the documentary, we see the class of 1970 come back together and watch them relive the exercise. And frankly, it's very cringy, but at least to me, kind of important. It really serves as this sort of time capsule as to what talking about race in a white classroom to kids was like in 1970. And it's honestly really baffling to me, but I guess not that surprising at how still very white the group is in 1985, 15 years later. The now adults were allowed to bring their spouses and friends along, and everyone is still white. That's not to put the blame on the individuals involved, but it really shows how segregated people's bubbles still are by both de jure and de facto segregation. So before the exercise begins, Elliot asks her all-white class, what are the outgroups in U.S. society? And the kids answer accordingly. Black people and Native Americans are the main answers. She also asks how they react when they see someone different, and a lot of the kids say they giggle or laugh or point, etc. Then she asks why, and they say it's because of their skin color. Lastly, she asks them, do you think you would know how it would feel to be judged by the color of your skin? Some say yes, and she responds, I don't think you do. And then the segregation by eye color begins. At first she gets resistance from her class for saying one eye color is better than the other, but when she says it's science, they tend to go along with it. In some articles, she goes into detail saying that in class she justifies the segregation because there's a link between melanin and intelligence, and therefore brown-eyed people are smarter. This is all made up, by the way. <laughs> I do think that because she's their teacher, they kind of just go along with it anyway and tell her what she wants to hear, but it is also interesting to see and hear the kids' reactions when they're talking about real racialized groups. Kids can be just as racist as adults and hold racial biases, so it's interesting to see how they learn and manifest those ideas and actions when asked because that's not something that's asked of a lot of kids, specifically white kids. As a kid who grew up in a very white school and was racially bullied since I was five, I know how racist kids can be and how there is real racist intent behind it. They know calling you a dog eater is going to get a reaction and they know to call you that because of what you look like and that's scary. And they laugh at your discomfort and tears because they struck the nerve they wanted to hit. And when you bring this up to white parents and educators, they don't really get it, or maybe they do, but they don't know how to make the kid see it, because for the kid, acting racist towards people of color is normal to them. It's normalized and encouraged by their communities in order to keep the status quo, so how do you undo that? It's a really tough question that doesn't have one answer. And most of the time, the school doesn't want to halt everything to teach white kids not to be racist to the racially othered kids when they're the minority of the student body. So they just switch classrooms or try to keep the kids separate, but then a new school year rolls around and there's new teachers who don't know about X, Y, or Z, and the cycle continues and the kids at the bottom continue to suffer. So I do appreciate that Elliot wanted to open the door for this kind of stuff and make it personal, have the kids be open about how they see and treat people of color. But I have a lot of beef with the exercise too, one of them being using Martin Luther King Jr.'s death to further her own teaching agenda, which leaves a bad taste in my mouth. But we'll get to all of my other gripes later. Back to the 1970 exercise. So the blue-eyed kids are discriminated against first, and the brown-eyed kids are on top, and the kids accept what's going on. The blue-eyed kids have to wear black collars and later armbands at recess and are treated as inferiors. They can't interact with the brown-eyed kids, and the brown-eyed kids are privileged, getting two servings if they choose to at lunch and extra recess time. The next day, the roles are reversed, and then they reflect back on what just occurred and how it ties back to racism. Elliot first asks the children how they felt when they were being discriminated against, and a lot of them rightfully say, not good. Then she asks what it felt like to have power, and a lot of the kids liked it. One of them said he felt like a king. Elliot then asks, is it fair to judge someone by their eye color? They say no. Is it fair to judge someone by their skin color? They say no. And she says, You say no now, but what if you see a black man on the street, for example? Are you going to laugh and point? And they say no. When the adults watch and get to chime in and reflect on their past selves, one of them says that he felt like being in the superior brown-eyed group made him feel as though he had this permission to finally get revenge on some of the other kids in the class. He said he had pent-up feelings of rage about some of the other kids at the time, and he was allowed, by virtue of his eye color, to act on those feelings. In the film, Elliot says when one of the groups got power, she saw nice kids turn into nasty, vicious kids. But clearly, there was some cliquishness and meanness already there. Just because they're an all-white class doesn't mean there isn't tension between students. Also, she doesn't know how these kids act around minority kids on a daily basis. 
She doesn't know if they already bully kids of color in their neighborhood or when they're out and about. Though Riceville does seem to be very white and clearly they all live in a very white bubble, she doesn't know if they're nasty or not. So I find it kind of hard to believe that they're like these sweet, perfect angels and then the exercise turns them bad or brings out their true colors. But I do like how the privileged kids realize their privilege because I think that's what's missing a lot of the time from these conversations. The kids at the top, their power is seldom questioned. Rather, the victims are usually blamed for their situation. Why didn't you stand up to them? Why didn't you call for help? All the blame is put on them for not doing anything, instead of questioning why a kid would feel entitled to bully another kid in the first place. To further legitimize the exercise, she points out how bias affects test scores. She says whatever group is at the bottom on a given day, their test scores go down and vice versa, showing the importance of treating students equally and perhaps giving more attention to marginalized students of different backgrounds. Most of the results of the blue eye brown eye exercise are inconclusive, but actual real life studies show that there is clear racial discrimination when it comes to test scores, whether it be due to access to good schools, biased questions on tests, or food insecurity and general poverty, most people People know at least today that the education system is a racist system at every level. And to me, it's sad that most white people didn't start taking this seriously or were even conscious of this bias until a white woman started making a fuss about it, when black people have been saying this for years that the system is rigged against them on purpose by white people so they can keep their power. So now that we understand how the basic exercise is taught to children, let's see how it's taught to adults. And for this, we'll talk about two exercises, one that Elliot did with prison guards and parole officers in 1985, and one that she did with an audience on Oprah in 1992. So let's go. Part 3 the 1985 prison guard exercise. In the next part of the documentary, we see where else Elliot's teachings have been shown, and one of them is at the Green Haven Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison in New York State. Here we see a sociology class being taught by a white professor in a class with mostly black and Hispanic students. They sit and watch the video of the 1970 class exercise in order to learn about prejudice. The irony honestly would be funny if it wasn't so sad. Thankfully, they're not actually going to reenact the thing, and after watching it, they come to the conclusion that the documentary wants you to conclude that the exercise was good. They don't show any opposing views. Back in Iowa, Elliot is invited to do her exercise at a prison where even though the state of Iowa is 98% white, the prison population is 20% black and Hispanic. The documentary doesn't question why this is, neither does Elliot. Elliot isn't there for the prisoners, however. She's there to help train the guards and parole officers. It's interesting to see the exercise done with adults who are a lot more articulate than the kids and realize a lot earlier the point of the exercise. In the exercise, the brown-eyed adults are privileged and the blue-eyed adults aren't. The blue-eyed adults have to mainly stand in the back, wear a green collar, and are forced to wait outside for a long time before being invited into the seminar room. They are then berated by Elliot for being lazy, forgetful, rude, aggressive, and argumentative. Some of them talk back and say they don't like being treated this way. Some just yell at her out of frustration. There are also black and Asian people present, which makes the exercise a little more interesting to say the least. I do want to point out though that Elliot's exercise hinges on people of color not having light colored eyes. Like she purposely chooses the blue eyed people to be the inferior class because then in her mind they're all going to be white and the people of color will be in the dominant position and not have to go through an unnecessary discrimination role play. But black people can have light eyes. Any race can have light eyes. Like how would that go? But getting back on track, during the seminar, there's this one meta conversation between a black man and Elliot when talking about how annoying the blue-eyed people are, which I thought was kind of funny and that I'll recount now. Elliot asks the man, what have you learned about the blue-eyed people? The black man says, they're stubborn and like to control people. I don't know why they're here. And we all know it's a race thing. He's calling out white people without necessarily saying the word white, but we all understand the subtext. Elliot says they're here because they're required to be, referring to some sort of racial quota. It's this weird meta conversation that kind of made me laugh a little at the absurdity of what was going on. Like we can't outwardly talk about race, but we are still talking about race at the same time. I don't know how effective that is, but it seemed to make the blue-eyed people really angry. After lunch, they regroup and reflect on what happened. One part that I did really like was when one of the blue-eyed people tries to both sides this whole thing and say, I know what it's like to be discriminated against, and then goes on to say, you don't have to be X, Y, or Z to be discriminated against. And then one of the brown-eyed people, another white woman, speaks up and says, you're a white woman. You don't know what it's like to be a racial minority, specifically a black woman. You don't get to both sides this thing, and I thought that was a good note to go out on. 
Part 4 the 1992 Oprah Winfrey Show Exercise. In 1992, Elliot made one of her five appearances on Oprah. Oprah says in the intro that the people in the audience thought they were just going to be on a regular episode of the show and that they had no idea about the exercise. Elliot, before the show, split them up by eye color, made the blue-eyed people the inferiors and made them wear green collars. She also made sure the show staff was rude to them, made them wait, didn't give them food, etc., while the brown-eyed people got donuts and were met with open arms. Throughout the episode, a disclaimer on the bottom of the screen pops up saying, this is an exercise on racism, because Oprah knew and everyone knew that this episode was going to blow up. And honestly, there's a reason why Oprah is as successful as she is, and that's because she's a great host and mitigator. Like, there's a group of 100 angry people all vying to be the next debate bro, but she takes everything in stride and makes it look easy. Honestly, props to her for doing this because it must have been so hard. Anyway, like usual, Oprah takes comments from the audience and they talk about how they felt about the experience. The blue-eyed people, just like the prison guards and the parole officers in 1985, are livid. They're mainly really angry white women and one really angry white guy who don't understand the point of the exercise because they're not racist, or in the case of the white guy, because he is racist and thinks racism is justified. But let's go through this episode scene by scene because it honestly is a beautiful train wreck. One of the first people to talk is a blue-eyed fellow educator who talks about the melting pot and then Elliot stops her and says something that actually was pretty poignant. She says that the melting pot idea of the U.S. was only created to erase white guilt as a way of saying we're all equal now. And when I was in college, I do remember how some of my professors didn't like the melting pot analogy and instead used a salad analogy instead because as Elliot says, we don't want to erase racial and cultural differences or smooth them out, but rather appreciate those differences. Elliot doesn't bring up the salad analogy, but I do think that this anti-melting pot idea was pretty big back in the 90s, and though it seems silly to argue about semantics, I do think that the language we use to talk about the US and our history matters because language shapes the way we think. Next, Elliot says something to the effect of people with brown eyes, even if they were part of the superior race, were sent to concentration camps during the Holocaust because they were seen as liabilities and threats, as if they were lying about their heritage. I don't know if this was true, but I found it kind of irresponsible for her to tout this on national TV without citing any sources. Digging into it more, I have found an academic paper written in 2002 by Professor Peter Sudfeld, a Hungarian-Canadian emeritus professor who escaped Auschwitz during World War II, where the thesis is that hair and eye color could save your life. The paper is entitled Lethal Stereotypes, Hair and Eye Color as Survival Characteristics During the Holocaust. However, in my opinion, that still doesn't excuse Elliot for just bringing this up without any backing to it. And like I'll say later in the video, she almost never cites any sources, not on Oprah or in her prepared seminars and lectures with adults. Alright, back to the video. And honestly, during her talks with adults, she never cites any sources, which I thought was really strange. She has presumably days and weeks to prepare her seminars and doesn't bring any packets or writings or slides, nothing for the reflection part of the exercise. Like that's kind of a red flag. She never talks about W.E.B. Du Bois' double consciousness, for example, which would fit right into the point of her exercise as it discusses how black people are seen and treated in a white man's world and how black people are ever conscious of their two-ness. As the boys wrote, It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. But this is never mentioned in any of the reflection parts of the seminars. Rather, the reflection part is usually just people yelling at each other, and no research or citations are used on the part of Elliot to try to actually educate these people on black life. Which almost makes Elliot seem, to me at least, like a pop scholar, which honestly she kind of is. Sorry. She never mentions any seminal texts by black authors and educators like Bell Hooks, one of her contemporaries who published Ain't I a Woman in 1981. And it seems as though she doesn't really interact with black scholars or texts, which I find really weird considering she tries to teach white people how black people feel, but at the same time doesn't actually cite any real black people's experiences. She just assumes she knows things from watching the news, TV shows, and movies, and that's kind of bad. I think it's also important to note that she says the N-word a lot. She says it on Oprah, too, for example. And you can make a million excuses you know, for her, but she still says it and it's just very wrong. 
Recently in 2020, she was making the interview rounds again and was wearing a sweatshirt with a quote from Dr. Nathan Runstein, a white guy, by the way. The quote reads, prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. And that's a nice sentiment, you know, as if we can just educate enough people to stop being racist, racism will end, which again, though, is a noble idea, doesn't really do anything. But honestly, that's what I chalk both her exercises with kids and adults up to. They don't do anything, but more on that later. The point of bringing up her sweatshirt quote is that it's not even a black person's quote, she's just uplifting and giving visibility to another white person. And as a mini tangent, Dr. Nathan Runstein is known for their 1993 book Healing Racism in America, a prescription for the disease. And this idea that racism is a disease that we can inoculate ourselves against, as Elliot says, it's a very white liberal idea that acts as though we can stop the spread of racism when it's not really spread by individuals but by institutions and systems bigger than ourselves. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to Oprah. So Elliot brings up how recently, in 1992, they discovered the first human was a black woman, and how our human ancestors came out of the continent of Africa. She really believes in this one race, the human race idea, which was popular at the time, but has really fallen out of fashion now. I think she says this as a way to refute racism, which a lot of liberals do, like as if debunking racism is a thing, or as a way to say we're all black which I don't really get. But one of my gripes that we'll talk about more later is if Elliot really gets racism. And spoilers, I think she does, but only to an extent. And the piece that she's missing is really crucial. She also brings up what she calls an excess of death among black people in the US, alluding to police brutality and the LA race riots, which were happening at the time. I just don't know why you're bringing the LA incident into this. She says if the white population had that many excess deaths, we do something about it. If we had that great a number of excess deaths among the white population, we would do something about it. Then there's the one angry white man in the crowd who I mentioned before, and this guy is just the worst. He basically says God created racists, so therefore racism isn't bad or is at least justified. You can't get away from the fact that God created the races and you are gonna be different. You can't help it. God created races. And he didn't want the races God to be like that. One race, the hum- Thinking back, I wonder if this guy was a plant in the audience. But sadly, I think he's just like a regular guy who actually believes this. Elliot responds saying humans invented racism, and then the crowd cheers. Daytime talk shows were really like the seeds of debate bro content, but people couldn't be anonymous, and it's just kind of great. Like seeing this public forum break out and everyone just being really raw. Like, can you imagine watching this live back in the day? Oprah gets to put her two cents in as well before they cut to commercial and talks about how the point of the exercise was to show white people how it feels to be racialized in the U.S., specifically what it's like being black. She talks about real-life instances of racism, like when women clutch their purses when a black guy enters a store, or how when she goes out shopping, storefronts put up signs that say, sorry, we're closed, or by appointment only. And though I think not a lot of people in the audience got what the exercise was about, it was nice hearing Oprah speak about her own struggles because it's not easy being vulnerable, and it made me emotional. However, one thing made me raise an eyebrow, and that's when she says, now you know how it feels. Can you imagine what that feels like? Now Now you know. know. (laughs) And I know she's only saying this as a platitude and I don't think she really believes this, but before she says this, she kind of talks about how racism manifests itself differently in contemporary times. She says, we have jobs, we can go where we want to go, we can do what we want to do, etc. And the reason we're doing this exercise is to show how racism shows itself differently nowadays. Racism is really about... Jane, who knows this so well, how you treat people. And though that's true, a new type of racism definitely emerged in the 80s and 90s when black and white people shared more physical space with one another, systemic racism still existed and continues to exist. Systems and institutions like the government, policing, prisons, Hollywood, schools, and housing are still racist, and that's never addressed on the show by Oprah or Elliot directly, but is brought up by black audience members on the show. And I think that people are afraid to change until we have a revolution there's going to be turmoil and more. Don't judge me, but what is she doing to make a change in the system? This is all about a system that oppresses people, and she's doing nothing. And I think in the mainstream, unknowingly or knowingly, the conversation about race changed from let's make systemic changes to the healthcare system, for example, to what we as individuals can do to end racism, which honestly, though important, is also kind of annoying. But it was a very convenient and strategic shift for the government to make. 
it was in the government's best interest to push this narrative that racism is over now, and all that's left to do is fix yourselves. Get yourselves in order. It's on you. It's not on us. And again, this isn't to say that day-to-day -day racism is any easier to deal with than systemic racism, but the emphasis on white individuals needing to stop being racist and the problem will be solved is distracting from actual, real discussions about bigger changes that can be made that don't focus and center on white people. I also want to say that racism is more than just how you treat people. Yeah, that's part of it, but again, it's about a system that oppresses people. It's not just about how you treat others. But again, I do think that this was a strategic move when it comes to the powers that be. I especially think that the government and the U.S. education system, specifically, edited and manipulated Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech in such a way that it puts more onus on us for why black and white kids can't play together, and that's because we treat each other badly, not because there's like literal laws in place that literally bar racial integration. I think white politicians and government leaders and community leaders prefer us to talk about how racism makes us feel because A, we don't blame them for passing and upholding unjust laws and systems, and B, because it's harder to prove a case for racism on something that's so subjective. Having racism be about our emotions puts a lot of work on the victim because we have to argue that someone did something to us and that something is invisible. And of course, the person on the other end never intended to be racist. White people can simply say they didn't mean it and not have to interrogate themselves any further. And this is exactly what happens in most of Elliot's workshops. I don't want you to sit there and judge me or my friends if I'm not that way. I think it's terrible, terrible the way people are treated. But don't you tell me that I'm that way. And unfortunately, Elliot plays into this in that she cares too much about individuals changing their mindsets and not abolishing racist institutions or questioning why black people are disproportionately imprisoned and forced to watch her lectures on racism. Though she does recognize the privileges, even the systemic privileges that white people get as seen in the exercises where the brown-eyed people automatically just get things because of who they are, why that system is in place is never brought up. Why do the brown-eyed kids get a longer recess? Because they're brown-eyed. But really though, why? Well, it's because they rigged the system in their favor and took advantage of others for their own gain and they want to keep it that way forever. But that's never talked about to the kids or to the adults. As the black people say on the show, this is about systems and it's going to take bigger changes than what we could ever do individually. And unfortunately, the exercise doesn't end with the blue eye and brown eyed group reconciling or forming coalitions, but rather they become embittered and even more set in their ways. The blue eyes hope that this never happens to them again, and the brown eyes are relieved not to have been in the blue eyed group. Is that the outcome we want? Learning about Jane Elliott reminded me a lot of FD Signifier's Bo Burnham video, where a lot of white people like Elliott are able to come to grips with their privilege and status and whiteness, but then want to do something about it. But then they're like, it's too hard though, so they either give up or become extremely nihilistic. But Elliott doesn't give up, and instead directs her energy to try to tackle individual beliefs, which is still hard, but not really what will affect the biggest change, and that's frustrating. After Oprah says, now you know how it feels, Elliot does bring up that the white audience gets to go home, take off their collar, and leave, whereas people of color can't. And I do think that this was a strategic part on Oprah, because she probably knew that if she said something like that, the audience would be really angry, but if it came from a white person, it, it, they wouldn't get garnered the same reaction. Um, but that's just me projecting. Elliot is fully aware that one or two days of this isn't enough to stomp out racism, but she does hope that it makes people more empathetic. But honestly, again, it just makes people really angry, and that anger is wholly unproductive in my eyes. When they come back from the commercial break, things get really heated. One blonde woman from the brown eyed group is really fired up and says, how dare you accuse me of being racist, don't judge me, blah blah blah. Another one asks Elliot, just why is she so angry and bitter? You're obviously very angry, and I... I, hostile and I really feel badly about that. I... The tall white guy comes back and says if no one was in charge it would be total anarchy. And Elliot responds, it's not about getting even, it's about getting equity. See the whole thing is not about getting even, it is about getting equity. 
I like that with her adult groups, she brings up the fact that this isn't about revenge or what we know today as the oppression Olympics, but rather about equity and not trying to become the oppressor. However, when talking about why men are on top and women are at the bottom when it comes to the patriarchy, Elliot brings up this weird argument that men have more physical strength and that's why they're at the top. Men took that power by their physical strength. I know people get caught on live TV or in streams where they say things that get messy and that's fine, but this was like really bad. Like clearly Elliot is a feminist and I think even back in the 90s most feminists didn't believe that men were at the top because of something as subjective as strength, but rather because they put themselves there on purpose and haven't left since. They created a false narrative that women were inferior and that men were more logical leaders and thinkers, etc. Patriarchy is based on lies and falsehoods. And it's not that women didn't fight back, but that men made sure to accrue wealth, land, and political power to hold their positions, passed laws barring women from holding office, from gaining land and having jobs. It's not that hard to parse out. But it doesn't appeal as much to our senses as man big, woman small, so, so much for nuance. And the same thing goes for white supremacy. White people looked around themselves and decided consciously to take what wasn't theirs just because they could. They saw disadvantaged people and thought, let's exploit them, and that's basically it. But again, that doesn't sound as logical as white people are smarter. So that brings us to the end of the 1992 Oprah Winfrey Show exercise. Now let's discuss the efficacy of the exercise when it comes to both the children and the adults. Part five, is the exercise good? On a surface level, I do appreciate Elliot's exercise. I get what she's trying to do. Step into another person's shoes, see how they live before you judge them. This is probably a value she was taught in school and in pop culture, as it's very similar to the lesson Scout learns in To Kill a Mockingbird, a film that came out just six years before she implemented her exercise. And I think with kids, the exercise works more because it's just teaching basic empathy, which a lot of kids need to learn. It's not something that's innate. Maybe it doesn't teach about racism, but it can at least try to teach kids not to bully, and on a surface level, I think that's fine. However, I don't think it should be continued today, not only because I don't think kids should have to go through that to learn empathy, but also because I feel like reading and learning about people of color and their histories on their own terms is a better way to unlearn racism. I think it would also help to have ongoing discussions about why white students may feel hostile towards black students and other students of color. I liked the open discussion that the kids were having at first about how they react when they see a person of color, and I think it's more important to dive into that conversation rather than doing the exercise. But in the end, I think kids and adults need to unlearn racism by themselves. I think it's not something that can be forced out of someone, and not everyone will unlearn it, and that's just the sad truth. You can do your best to expose kids to different people and cultures, but in the end, it's up to them to continue that lifelong process and some people just won't. That's why I think centering individuals and making them change is kind of futile in the long run. And instead, there should be more focus on questioning larger institutions like prison systems, understanding their motivations and incentives and histories. In addition, both the classroom exercise and the adult exercise focus and center on white people. It centers their feelings, how they feel to be a person of color for a day. And I don't like that. I don't care how they feel. Let's actually talk to real people of color and center their feelings and their emotions and their stories. I also don't think the exercise really does anything for the adults and barely anything for the kids. I know it's supposed to teach empathy and I've read about people crying afterwards, but I just haven't seen that. From what I've seen, it just makes people really embroiled and continue to center themselves and makes them really defensive. And though maybe that's the point to show how just one day of discrimination makes them so angry, but again, I don't think that anger is useful or tells us anything we didn't already know. Calling out people for being racist, I've learned, usually just shuts people down. What you can do instead is talk about how being racist isn't something you either are or aren't, it's just that you don't have a choice in the systems you participate in and or benefit from, or you don't always have a choice. So many times talks about racism focus on what you do or believe, and not about the larger world at hand and your position in that world, and that I believe is the downfall of the exercise. If anything, I think it unfortunately plays into the Oppression Olympics thing too much to be that effective. Even though Elliot is adamant that's not the point, if that's what people take away from it, then maybe it's not a good exercise. I think a better question we should be asking is if the exercise understands racism. I feel like Elliot's intentions are in the right place, but I still think her understanding of racism is very limited. She gets that racism is bad, that racism is based on arbitrary factors, and that stereotypes are based on falsehoods. 
She understands that systemic privileges are involved as seen in the exercise where the privileged kids get more stuff for no reason and how it's an invisible privilege they're not necessarily conscious of and how the school just allows it because that's the way it is. But the exercise doesn't ask bigger questions, which it definitely should for the adult audience. It doesn't get to the real roots of racism, which are illogical. Racism doesn't make sense. You can't fight racism with logic. She says the underprivileged group is just as equal as a privileged group, but she never asks why the privileged group is privileged. What did the white people in the room do to get where they are? Why are they occupying the space they do? Why do they get special treatment? You could say it's pseudoscience, falsehoods, but why do those exist? And it's because white people want to stay in power and manipulate you into believing lies, and it's your job to undo that teaching for yourself. I feel like she knows this to an extent, but it's never brought up in the discussions because I think they get too heated to really get people to listen. I think there's a missed opportunity to talk more calmly about racism and really reflect on your own part in it, as well as why there's such an incentive to keep racist systems intact that's just not being had. I think what would have been more helpful would be for the kids and adults to write their own rules for the inferior group, and maybe that would make it more personal and more institutional. They would have ownership over their own acts, which is how real racism works. It's not something that just pops into existence one day because people feel like it. Racism is deliberate. It's purposeful when it comes to the systemic level, and that's really missing from these talks. We learn how implicit bias exists on an individual scale, but we don't see it played out on a larger scale. I think what's really lacking from the U.S. public education system when it comes time to talk about race is really talking about race. Not eye color, but race and how everyday students hold up racist beliefs in institutions and how teachers do as well. What's missing is interrogating our own racial biases and histories in our schools, individually and systemically. A questioning of the U.S. government is also non-existent in most schools in my experience. Talking about our own hand in global imperialism, racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia are conversations that aren't happening. And we don't need an exercise that's going to make everyone feel heated. Sure, people are going to get heated regardless, and sometimes anger can be constructive, but from what I've seen, it really works against the end goal. I think a lot of the time white people want talks about racism to get really ugly and think the uglier they get, the more deep they are. I think Elliot believes this. I think Michael Scott from The Office parodies this idea in a very comedic way. I think my college sociology professor also thought that getting real about racism is just saying really racist stuff or getting others to say racist stuff, but that's not true. Talks about race don't have to be ugly or mean. They can be rational, and I wish I saw that more with Elliot's exercise, but I didn't. I highly suggest listening to and supporting black creators on YouTube who talk about race and work to educate and entertain because honestly, that's who we should be listening to. I personally really like FD Signifier, who I mentioned before, the Channel 4 Harriet, Princess Weeks, Harry on a Hook, Aisho, and Cat Black. They make great content about their interests as well as talk about race and are all extremely engaging and knowledgeable and are a joy to watch. We should be listening to black creators who talk from their own experience and who cite actual sources. We should be centering their voices and their narratives and not continue to solely listen to someone who inserted themselves into the debate just because they had the privilege to do so. Part 6. Diversity Training by a White Woman even though her hometown of Riceville openly hated her after her 1968 interview with Johnny Carson, she went on to find national success as an educator and as one of the top diversity workshop leaders. In 1970, she demonstrated the exercise for educators at the White House Conference on Children and Youth. ABC broadcast a documentary about her work. She has led training sessions at General Electric, Exxon, AT&T, IBM, and other corporations, and has lectured to the IRS, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Department of Education, and the Postal Service. She has spoken at more than 350 colleges and universities. She has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show five times. In addition, the textbook publisher McGraw-Hill has listed her on a timeline of key educators, along with Confucius, Plato, Aristotle, Horace Mann, Booker T. Washington, Mariah Montessori, and 23 others. Like I mentioned earlier, I find it so odd that this white woman teacher became the face of LGAT workshops, also known as large group awareness training, during the latter half of the 20th century. During the 1970s and 80s in the U.S., workshops such as Elliot's gained popularity in and out of the corporate world. They went by names such as team building, large group awareness training, consciousness training, management by objective, and transformative leadership training. 
While the heart of what Elliot did was racism abatement, she also began folding into her intense workshops issues of gender and age bias, along with prejudice based on conventional Western beauty standards. By the mid-1980s, Elliot had retooled herself as a new age visionary. And like I stated in the intro, in the early 70s, Elliot's fame reached the likes of Stanford professor Philip G. Zimbardo. Stanford professor Philip G. Zimbardo described Elliot's classroom activity as a remarkable exercise, more compelling than many done by professional psychologists. That Zimbardo had been so struck with Elliot made sense. In 1971, when Elliot was pitting blue-eyed students against their brown-eyed counterparts, Zimbardo was conducting his own contentious research, known as the Sanford Prison Exercise, to show how easy it was to make thugs out of college students once they were given an overdose of power. Though Elliot didn't inspire Zimbardo's experiment, they were contemporaries and he did praise her work as it was similar to his. Elliot was mainly a success, but like I said earlier, a lot of people became bitter because of the exercise and just plain angry and resentful. As one U.S. West employee enrolled in a workshop said, She manipulated us. It was an unbelievable breach of trust. It was obscene. Sometimes I wonder if Elliot did more harm than good, and I honestly don't know, but I lean more on the side that she just made everyone more set in their views, mainly that they don't need this because they're not racist. And you can argue that shows how needed this workshop is, or you can more logically see how much of a failure the workshop was, how it didn't tell us anything we didn't already know, and maybe how she should have taken a different approach. I also find it again annoying how a white woman became the face of this movement when a lot of what she was teaching has been discussed for decades by black scholars and educators who have real skin in the game. I also dislike her use of MLK to frame her story because it just feels wrong to me. She used his death as a platform for her own educational exercise, and that's kind of unforgivable. Conclusion. In 2020, Elliot told NPR, things are changing, and they're going to change rapidly if we're very, very fortunate. If this ugly change, if this negative change can happen this quickly, why can't positive change happen that quickly? I think it can. During 2020, Elliot went on a press junket about how she felt about the BLM protests because that's what we needed to hear another white person. But she does seem to be quite progressive, though also kind of cringy. I think what sums her up best is her own quote. God created one race, the human race, but humans created racism. Like she falls into that common platitude of we're one race, but then also is sentient enough to know that racism is a social construct. She gets it, but only as much as a white progressive woman can get it. And honestly, that's fine. I'm not here to drag her or to try to cancel her. I think overall she's just a person who just happened to think herself a little too important in this discussion. What I am curious to know is if any of you experienced this exercise in your own life and how racism was taught in your public school, if you went to a public school that is. I want to hope it's better than it was when I was a kid, where a lot of our racial education was like in Adam's Family Values, where all the other kids were made to dress up as Native Americans, and where in 8th grade we explicitly learned that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. But let me know down below, and thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of the exercise in this video down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.